Panther Baby is about my journey as a young man uh, growing up in New York City and growing up in the midst of the excitement and turbulence and confusion of the 60s and finding that path to manhood which led me toward uh, first the Civil Rights Movement and then the Black Panther Party. I think my whole childhood was, was kind of a prep for the Panthers because the, the, the Panthers kind of exploded on the scene, at least in terms of you know, national consciousness and, um, uh, and, and in terms of my personal consciousness, uh, you know, right after Dr. King uh, was assassinated. When Dr. King was assassinated, I got really, really angry and that fired me up. And I, I decided, you know, you, we'd seen on TV um, Stokely Carmichael talk about black power and H. Rap Brown. And I was excited by that. I, w I went down 125th Street uh, the night that Dr. King was there and participated on the fringes of the riot. I shouldn't have been there. Uh, you know, uh, the cops started chasing me, thinking I was a looter. Uh, almost got shot, came, got rescued by some, some men who I later learned was Panthers, but didn't know was Panthers. Came home and sat next to my grandmother and we shed tears watching the assassination and riot on television. And I went to school the next morning and uh, announced to all of my friends that I'm gonna be a black militant. And one of my best friends was a white kid, a Jewish kid named Paul Kirshner, and he said, Eddie, I don't know if you can announce you're gonna be a black militant like it's a career choice. Are you gonna be a doctor or a lawyer? I was like, no, Paul, you watch. I felt like I needed to fight for, for justice and for equality. What I, what I really believed because of the civil rights movement was that it was black America uh, versus white America. Uh, that, uh, that because of the teachings of the NAACP and, and Dr. King, that it was black America um, asking white America for equality and for justice and not to be uh, discriminatory and not to be mean and not to turn on the fire hoses and let the police dogs go. And then after Dr. King uh, was killed, um, the black power movement the cry seemed to be like, we're not asking, we're demanding, we're taking, if need be, these things that are basic human rights. So that's what I thought when I went into the Panther office that first day, that we're gonna come in and that the conversation and speeches was gonna be about taking what's ours. Uh, and that, you know, I'd seen images of the Panthers on television with guns and so that we would, you know, be armed and sent out to fight that very first day. I thought I was getting a gun, I was given a stack of books. And the other thing, uh, that I was made to understand is that this wasn't a struggle about, uh, 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 it wasn't a struggle that was about black America against white America. It was a struggle about the, the haves and the have-nots. That there were uh, white people who were poor and struggling, uh, Latino people, Asian people, and that they were all being oppressed by the same system. In fact, the greeting in the Black Panther Party was all power to the people. And people would say, right on. And then the, the speaker would say, well, that means black power to black people. And so you'd get excited right on. And they said, but that means white power to white people. And that means brown power to brown people and red power to red people and yellow power to yellow people. And then the speaker would go on to explain that we have a system that's oppressing everyone, that, that oppression is business, that slavery was a business, that slavery just didn't happen because or the slave traders decided, well, we hate black people, we're gonna make them slaves. And racism was really the marketing strategy for, uh, for the slave, you know, for the slave trade, because, you know, you wanted to be able to get people to buy, and those people that might have, have any pangs that, um, uh, that it's uh, not right to enslave a fellow human being. Don't worry about it, they're not human, they're subhuman. So owning an African slave is like owning, you know, a donkey or a cow or anything else that you would make your farm farmland prosper. But, but the Panthers showed how it was a business. So you got a really unique and radical perspective of what was going on and, and what you were fighting for. And the ground shifts underneath you. You know, even as you understand, I am in uh, the most dynamic organization it is, but not just because of what I'm seeing on the media of Panthers standing up with, you know, berets and, and leather coats and sometimes with guns, but because of their clear revolutionary thinking. Uh, that was really uh, not only organizing folks in the black community, but in a number of other communities. Just a few months after I joined the Panther Party, um, my Nooney's house, my grandmother's 
uh, uh, house. Her door was kicked in at four o'clock in the morning and I was uh, taken out the house in handcuffs and chains and charged as a case that became known as the Panther 21 case. And it was a bunch of conspiracy charges that said, you know, we had weapons, that we were conspiring to launch attacks, you know, citywide attacks against, you know, stores and uh, shopping malls and police stations. And um, that number 21 was arrived at because everyone in any kind of a leadership position was arrested. And although I was the youngest, I was head of the high school cadres. And so my name came up uh, on that list. We were facing 300 plus years, and this was happening all over the country. Um, you know, uh, Panther offices were, were being raided. Um, in, in Des Moines, Iowa, the offices was blown up uh, in, in, in Chicago. Fred Hampton was killed while he was sleeping. Brilliant speaker, brilliant organizer who was bringing all of the gangs in Chicago together to be progressive, to lay down their weapons and, and to do things. Um, and it was part of a national attack, you know, against the Black Panther Party and continued and continued until the final destruction of the Black Panther Party. Um, eventually what happened was that the Panther 21 was acquitted of all charges. And that was because we set out to make a statement in the courtroom. Um, and Fanny Shakur, Tupac's mom, was one of the Panther 2 and 1, and she was brilliant at this. Uh, she decided early on that she was going to defend herself. Uh, she had read a book by uh, uh, Fidel Castro called History Will Absolve Me. And in his summation, he basically said, governments always want to criminal criminalize the liberation movement. That's what you do. You want to dehumanize people so you can oppress them, and then when they stand up, you want to call that a criminal activity. Uh, when, when in fact we are the victims and you are the criminals. But it's okay, whatever verdict you reach, whatever you do today, history will absolve me. And Fanny said, I want to make that statement. And we realized we wanted to make that statement. So as the uh, New York State was kind of happily trying their conspiracy case, we were putting them on trial. We were saying, what did happen to Malcolm X? You know, because he stood up in a way and he started talking about class struggle. Is that why he was murdered right here in New York City? What happened with Dr. King? When, at the point when Dr. King started talking about class struggle when he was organizing sanitation workers, black workers and white workers, he's killed. And when he denounces the war, the war in Vietnam as a war of capitalist exploitation. And, you know, an, an agent would get on and we said, well, you had the Black Panther Party under surveillance. Did you have the Civil Rights Movement under surveillance? Did you have Malcolm X under surveillance? And, and, and the jury began to listen. And then we really fought it. And, and, you know, the prosecutor was just like, oh, come on already. But we drug out the jury selection process to make sure that we could get as diverse a jury as possible. So there were a lot of African Americans and there were a lot of women on the jury. And why? Because they, they are victimized in society and could possibly believe, possibly, that a cop could lie. Could possibly believe, could possibly believe that the system could do something and get someone and impress someone. But still we thought we were making a case for history. Uh, and then surprisingly, when the verdict came back, the, uh, the 21 was, was acquitted of every charge. You know, when I, when I went in it, it, uh, to the Black Panther office, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. And, and for me, I, um, I was an orphan, right? I'd been raised by wonderful, uh, you know, adoptive grandparents, but, but grandpa passed away when I was 12 years old, never knew my dad. So I was a honor student and a choir boy, all that's true, but it's still I was hanging out with the older guys and you know, trying to shoot a basketball and trying to learn how to smoke a cigarette and trying to be cool with the girls. So it was as much for me as uh, about the search for manhood. Uh, and the Panthers had a definite manhood swagger, uh, you know, as it was about joining the movement. And I think that first day, my whole consciousness got shaken up because it wasn't what I expected. It wasn't a hate meeting. Uh, <clears throat> it was a meeting about service and about love. It was about enlightenment. It certainly was about understanding, respect, women. There were women in charge that very first day and it was conversations about male chauvinism along with racism that very first day. And as I was leaving the Panthers, Panthers office with my books, not my gun, um, and with this idea that it was going to be about, uh, you know, community struggle and class struggle, not about getting whitey, there was a poster that was hanging near the door, near the posters of Malcolm X and Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and it was a poster of Che Guevara. And it was a quote uh, from a speech that Che had given a few years earlier. And uh, the quote was, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, let me say that revolutionaries are guided by great feelings of love. And I kind of knew that I was in the right place. And I knew I was in the right place because 
I wasn't raised to hate. You know, Noonie, my grandmother, raised me to love. Uh, she raised me to be tolerant. She raised me to understand that, uh, that you could make a way out of no way if you just kept working hard and you believed and you respected other people. And, and, and it was exciting. I still get to be macho and not make Noonie mad, you know, so it was that. And so it wasn't what I expected. And I think that the, the, the lesson of history that, uh, that uh, when you hear someone talk about the Panther Party and they understand that the Panthers wasn't all about hating white people. In fact, it wasn't about hating white people at all. And it certainly wasn't all about the, vi the violence. These are the two big kind of mis misconceptions. And so I think most people that come into the Panther office the first day to join experience that revelation. And then people who, came in con who come in contact with the Panthers, either back then or now through uh, you know, through films and through books and, and, and through contact with Panthers who were there are also surprised in that way.